Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the this is my uh, master's paper, which um, I did with TU Dublin. So um, this is obviously a, con a condensed version of it, um, and obviously in the time constraints, like my colleagues have all referred to before me, um, it'll be a very quick snapshot of what was what was actually a big body of research. So, as we've already said, the zeitgeist of Irish architecture, engineering, construction, and the operations industry is digital construction and collaborative processes. So this industry has emerged from the worst recession that we have seen in living memory, and this is thankfully now booming again, and is undergoing the global transition towards BIM and an informa information revolution or fourth generation industry revolution. So my extensive research, which I've already alluded to, um, was critically appraising the potential for public works contracts clients to leverage the benefits of BIM from BIM processes. So first, a little bit about myself. I'm um, a complete BIM advocate, probably like all of you here in the room. I'm an RAI registered architect with over 20 years experience, and I'm currently working as a BIM manager and senior project information manager with JJ Rashkin, assisting in the delivery of level two BIM and ISO 19650 compliant projects. Um, and I achieved first class honours in this particular, uh, which I'll be showing today, the detailed research paper here. So a little bit about JJ Rattigan. Um, it's a tier one award-winning contractor and it's one of the top five main contractors in Ireland. We have a turnover of over 341 million in 2018 and we employ over 290 people across five different locations, two of which are here in uh, Galway and uh, Dublin where I'm based, Ligo, Slig London, Sligo and Cork. Apologies. Um, we also recently received ISO 19650 accreditation um, and so we, as a company, they made the strategic decision to transition to BIM in 2013 and we actively use BIM across all our projects. So BIM is at the heart of digitization and it's transforming the built environment like we have said, but the clients are beginning to ask for BIM on projects which is very much noted, but the fact is that they don't seem to know what they're actually looking for, what they need to be getting out of BIM. The construction industry has been very slow to embrace digital technologies and again this is beginning to change and it's well documented that procuring projects or built assets through BIM has major advantages. Obviously it has all the clash detection benefits, it can, it's be building the building twice, once in the virtual world, sort out all the issues, second in the real life when all those issues are a bit more streamlined mm -hmm. and it's at the progress and it, it means that for a client you're minimising the risks that may, <coughs> may occur. So the objectives of the research were to critically appraise, the, appraise excuse me, this, the current state of BIM engagement on public works, to critically examine the barriers to clients and why these may occur, and to perform a gap analysis between the BIM process and maybe what is actually put into the EIR, the OIR, the AIR and the BEP. You know what those acronyms are, everybody in the room, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into it. And then uh, basically what's, uh, what is a set of solutions or a toolkit was to be derived from the literature and also t tailored with the interviews. Because what I did was I created the set of toolkit from the literature and from you know industry experience myself. And then I presented this to each of the interviewees, um, of which there was an extensive number. Um, and they were able to then tailor what they thought of that. And then what I come up with, the, the, I come, came up with at the end is a very definitive set of tool, a toolkit, a set of solutions, which I think will really help engage clients. So, and then there's evaluation. This is obviously what's happened at the end to propose the suggested barriers and how we're going to overcome them. So obviously we looked at the literature. I looked at the, uh, obviously we couldn't do much linear research because of the time constraints. So I used a lot of annual surveys that were already conducted and I looked at the gap analysis, as I've said. I also looked at the public works contracts, which we'll come on to. So in terms of the consultant, the Boston Consulting Group, the transformative power of BIM report, which ha came out in 2016, identified the significant savings that can be realized from digitization. So this report in identifies the full-scale digi full scale digitalization excuse me, of construction products could lead to savings of 13 to 21 percent in the design and in the construction phase with uh, sorry the design and construction phase and 10 to 17 percent in the operations phase and however a client a possible barrier to client engagement might be that there's no clarification of who is making these savings because very often the client might be building the building but they may be leasing it out to a tenant so the tenant might be getting the benefits of what's actually been put into the model and the, and the built asset at the end but the client who's actually paying for it is not attributing 
the, the savings. He's not getting the savings directly out of it. So um, another potential barrier was that, was that was investigated was the possibility, as I said already, that the, the client does not identify adequately what they're looking for in terms of the EIR and the OIR and all of those documents, that suite of documents that's very important. Um, again, the, the research goes into the OIR as the overall, like the skeleton, and then the AIR is the particular asset and the EIR is the exchange information requirements, was called employer's information requirements. But, and they all formulate and create the BEP, which is a very important document. So if the client is not actually establishing correctly what he needs at the beginning, he isn't going to be able to get it at the end. So that, uh, I think, is a big issue. Um, and then in terms of the, the various quotes that were found, the clients may see BIM as a cost, and there's more education needed, and new roles may be required, which is what I'm coming on to in one of the solutions. So, the, obviously, as I said, we looked at the public works contracts, GCC. These were created by the Office of Government <coughs> Procurement, and there are 10 contracts, which my previous colleague alluded to. And uh, the, I, the objectives of these was to get greater cost certainty at the award, contract award, value for money, more efficient delivery of projects, and, um, but there's no reference to BIM. There's absolutely no reference to BIM in those documents, which is shocking, I think, in this day and age. So basically, the interviews that were completed were completed with key stakeholders across the Irish AO, AECO industry. Ten, industry. ten interviews in all took place. You can see there who they were with. And this was to get, because I wanted to get an absolute in-depth insight into what actually is going on on the coalface, on the ground, in the business, not in the, the literature, and in the theory end of things, but actually what's going down on the ground and see if there was any difference in those two. So this was, I wanted to, I actually also specifically targeted people who were actually working on the same project. So I picked three basic big projects and I picked um, an architect who would be working on it, the client, and then the, um, the BIM manager. So I would get a, a 360 degree view is what I was looking for. So I could really get gainful insight into how I could think my, my, my toolkit and my set of solutions would be really useful for the industry. So the key findings, I can't go into all of them now. Like we said, we've got a very big time constraint. Excuse me, but um, basically they, they did refer to the fact that, as I'd already discovered, that the public works contracts don't make any reference to BLIM, and they did suggest that this should be inserted as a separate clause in the uh, public works contracts. It's very important that this goes in, because if it's not in the contract document, people don't pay any attention to it. So the BIM manager also referred to, which you've probably heard before, that the fact that the term building information modelling can be a bit of a misnomer because obviously people don't actually see that as it being about the documentation and the process and how the standards are applied on site and through projects. So, and then another of the interviewees said that it's a holy trinity, it's all about the graphical religious reference, but you know, it's all about a graphical model, the non-graphical model and the documentation. That's all critical in that. So just as an update to that, the public work contracts that I had looked at, they have been subsequently re revised recently in June 2019, and the amendments that are, are <coughs> due, were, were changed to them were largely due to GPR, GTP or uh, data protection provisions. There's still no mention of BIM, and this is urgently needs addressing by the GCCC. So if anyone's here today, could they please pass that on? Um, then the other thing is, as I said already, that the FM consultant that I interviewed um, was also because I wanted to get the full round picture of that from all different sides. I also wanted to see the asset and the end point of the, of the, the, of the asset, of the, the uh, project. So he actually identified as well who really makes the savings. It's not always <coughs> the client. And the BIM enabled it, a lot of, a lot, another um, thing that was very important was the client, uh, one of the clients thing mentioned in it that they oh, the clients really only care about the operations phase of an asset. So it's very refreshing to see that the ISO, the new ISO standard that we have, makes some reference, although Billy said that it's just a one-liner, at least there's some reference in there to the whole life cycle of the asset and they're looking at the built environment because ultimately the client is dealing, they're very busy and they want to just have the end point and have what they need out of their particular asset. And then obviously what we've already alluded to, my previous colleague, the fact is that Phil, um, David Philp was also interviewed 
um, and he gave a very good insight saying that you know that he totally agrees that the lack of education is basically a major barrier and that's where we really need to address that. So I'm just going to rush on now to go into the outcomes because obviously I can't tell you all about the research but there were four basic outcomes, four basic key insights that came out of my research. Improved education and a BIM online portal should be provided by the government. I think the government needs to be rolling and pushing this through on across the board on the Irish construction industry, particularly in light of Brexit. We've got a real opportunity here. They did a very good job of implementing BIM. Um, it has been patchy in some areas of actually being adopted, but the fact is that the way they rolled it out was very good. We need to be actually getting that involved. The reason why an online portal would be good is because it can engage people who are already in the workforce, the existing workforce. The new workforce, the, t the colleges and that, are actually getting up to date with the latest technology and standards, and they are already, the graduates that are coming out there are already proficient in these tools. But it's the existing workforce that need to be brought along so that we're all going together on this. And then I also thought that the new role of a client BIM consultant should be included, and this should probably be put in as a mandate from government, because the, this is where some of my colleagues today, this morning, have been referring to the fact that they need to make sure they establish what they need at the end point. You know the mantra, begin with the end in mind. They need to be sure what they're going to get at the end point. And in order to do that, they need someone to hold their hand. They're very busy doing their own jobs, running their businesses. They don't have time to upscale on, on BIM. They very often see BIM as being, um, you know, a lot of acronyms and something that doesn't really apply to them. It's to do with models, whereas actually it's really something concrete that they need to be helped with. And the client, the, this BIM consultant can help them do that. And then also the fact that we do need a BIM mandate in order to drive engagement. Mm. So I've kind of gone through most of these now in terms of the education. This is the real barrier. It would also help inform clients. I think the online portal would be helped to, to um, and then the education in terms of the existing workforce. For me as an architect, it's quite disappointing for my, my body, which is the RII, to see that you know they have a lot of, of various different CPD projects and to do with you know, uh, courses that you can do and PSDP and uh, Science Certifier and all those BCAR, but there's very little there for BIM. And that's disappointing, frankly. So I think the, all the institutes need to work together on this. There needs to be more collaboration to get this uh, pushed across. And then in terms of the GCC, the, the ownership of the model is a real thing that I have come across multiple times on level two BIM projects, that the ownership is, is uh, still an issue even with the new regulations. The client is basically, it's just like traditional processes. You do the drawings, the client owns the drawings, the copyright rules apply. And I went and identified this in depth with and had the, the discussions with the solicitor who is a leading solicitor in the Irish construction industry and he was able to identify that yes the same copyrights should apply there shouldn't be an issue with sharing models you can attach caveats to it so you know the fact is that they're work in progress models that's usually what I do on the projects that I'm on I make sure that the design team um, and the fit out team who may be separate and maybe the you know the design team are reluctant to share the models they have nothing to be worried about it's just that this is going to be a work in progress model and it's used to be developed from that. So um, another thing that would happen is that another of the clients also said that an issue that had happened to them was that um, the, the, when the models weren't shared, say for instance on one of the, the big clients that I was speaking to, they um, want to do an extension to an existing building. The problem was that the, because the design team were so reluctant to share their models, they wanted to build the building, the extension right beside the existing building, obviously, and there was a tanking detail which they wanted to get, and the, they had a, endless trouble trying to get that actual information from the, the previous architect who didn't want to share it. And then also in terms of um, other developments, like these things need to be tied down so that it, there's improvement across the board for the clients who are ultimately pay all of us in the room here. So another key insight, as I've said, is that they, um, the GCC contracts have no reference to BIM. Now, what I did get from the solicitor who I interviewed was saying that the BIM protocol second edition, which was up updated in 2018, is now more important than ever. So it's very important that you make sure that all your subcontractors on the projects actually sign this. Um, the GTC have committed to rewriting the BIM protocol to suit Irish contractual environment, but there is a question mark over why that is important. He's actually questioned that himself. And then also the fact is that the UK is a common law jurisdiction, 
So that means that any we would, Ireland will actually benefit by using the UK BIM protocol. We would have the benefit of any decisions that were made there in relation to the, BIM, the CIC BIM protocol. So it's actually probably a good idea to keep it. And then the next insight I had was obviously, I've alluded to it already, the new role of BIM, um, client BIM consultants should be included in the mandate for government. Um, the uh, BIM strategy, as I can call it, that is out there at the moment, is a bit, BIM is being introduced on a phase basis, on, depending on the size of project. Um, but the problem with that is that it is um, dependent on the local authority to in, enforce that and to how they see fit. That means that the, the actual way that it is being rolled out is patchy. Some are very good at doing it and some aren't. So I think ultimately we really need to have this um, BIM consultant to help as part of the mandate that I've discussed already. Um, also, one of the interviewees, and I agree, is that they had said, well, the, you know, the employer's representative would obviously be a person who could do that role as well. But I think it's important to note that that is a generally conflicted role if he is the same person, because he's within the design team. You need somebody to be outside the design team who can give impartial advice to the client and make sure that the, uh, the right verifications of the models are happening and that the, the right information is being, in, is being it's being generated for them in the models and across the board on the project team. So this role should be independent. Two minutes. Okay, so um, I'm just coming to the end. Um, so the basically the last key insight was the requirement for a BIM mandate. Um, that obviously I've said this already that they are going to be implemented on BIM has been, I called it suggested, but really it's a guideline that has been out there um, in terms of complex complex projects in 2019 and then medium and simple projects rolling out after that. It just means it's inconsistent. I think an overall date would actually drive engagement. It would be a line in the sand where everybody knew that they had to actually oh. cop on and get on the boat, get on the train. And it also Philip said that the mandate would focus, help focus client engagement, which I think is critical. And in the UK, he also stated that the mandate helped accelerate industry adoption and it, it built an opposite pipeline for industry to respond and invest in it. In other words, industry knew they had to engage. It wasn't an optional question mark. And I think that's where I leave you. So you. I hope I'll answer any of your questions. Thank you very much.